G'day everybody, Kylie Ward here, CEO of the Australian College of Nursing. Very excited to be here today uh, to get us started and uh, very importantly in the spirit of reconciliation, the Australian College of Nursing acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and uh, we pay our respects to uh, their elders past and present and give acknowledgement for their connection to land, sea and community. And we very much extend um, our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. And uh, today we're on the, I'm speaking, uh, Kate and I are actually uh, on the lands of the Kulon nations, but particularly we're both very privileged to live in the Boon Wurrung country. And so uh, I hope there might be a few others joining us from this country, but from wherever you are, we certainly pay our respects to the traditional custodians on the lands where we're all on. Very exciting um, for us today and I want to give you a, an introduction. I, I could spend half of the session talking about this brilliant woman but here's a, a small slice of uh, what to come. For 25 years Kate Jenkins has been leading change in corporate, government and community sectors, particularly in human rights and equal opportunity law. Kate has a proven track record of strategy and policy development and implementation in key business and government roles, navigating complex, sensitive environments to deliver lasting reform through key stakeholder engagement. Kate is a highly skilled community builder, influencer and educator and she uses digital skills to focus strategically for maximum impact. Of course, we, uh, we know her as Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner and she is accelerating change to lead to real gender equality from the household to the workplace. And I'm so excited in that sentence alone, Kate. It's certainly the, uh, an absolute pleasure for the Australian College of Nursing and a privilege to be able to have this Let's Talk Leadership session with Kate. And there's many areas that we're going to be able to have a chat to Kate today about. But first of all, I'm really uh, give you, Kate, a very warm welcome as you share a presentation with us. So over to you. Thank you very much, Carly, and I'm really pleased to be here. And I also acknowledge the traditional owners, as you and I have discovered from our remote locations. We're actually just a stone's throw from each other and uh, grateful to be on the land of the Boonarung people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I'll also start by also acknowledging the important work of nursing and uh, really what has been a year, a, a, a quite um, amazing year where the importance of particularly a couple of female dominated professions have really risen to the fore and particularly I think of nursing and teaching as the two professions that you know from that March date we suddenly turned to and needed support from as well as the important um, important role of women generally across our society but recognising that nurses include both men and women. Uh, so I'm really grateful for the work that has been done across this year um, particularly. Um, just starting, so, so my short presentation is going to talk about the, my most recent work which is the National Inquiry on Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. Um, and just to start, I'll, get, I'll start with a really simple definition of sexual harassment. I am a lawyer but don't worry this is not going to be a law lecture um, but it's interesting during the inquiry how confused people have got to about what sexual harassment is. Um, in particular, it put really simply, sexual harassment is unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature where a person receiving the conduct would be offended, humiliated or intimidated. And the focus of the inquiry was looking at workplaces and the experience of sexual harassment at work, which is unlawful under the Sex Discrimination Act. So if I just give you kind of the broad overview. Um, the National Inquiry started in 2018 with the support of the government and particularly the Minister for Women, then the Honourable Kelly O'Dwyer. Um, but really it was launched off the back of the Global Me Too movement and the conversation that was being had in uh, you know, so many homes as well as workplaces about the high prevalence of sexual harassment. Um, 
the goal of the inquiry, uh, as Australians do, is to uh, not spend too much time admiring the problem, but to really focus on solutions. So our inquiry was looking at the nature, prevalence and drivers of sexual harassment, but particularly so solutions to prevent and better respond to it going forward. And so the uh, background of it was it was a comprehensive 18-month process. Uh, we surveyed 10,000 people in 2018. Uh, we conducted, or I travelled the country, conducted 60 consultations with 600 participants. We received 460 submissions. We looked at the experience across the world and also Deloitte Access Economics did some economic modelling of the cost of sexual harassment. And at that point, I'll particularly call out that we had great uh, contributions from the nurse, nursing sectors and also social assistants. Uh, we did some consultations that particularly looked at the health sector and we received um, submissions. And for those of you who might be on this who did participate, um, I send you my great thanks. Um, the report was launched uh, with the current Minister for Women, um, Maurice Payne, on the 6th of March, having been tabled in Parliament the day before. And you will all know that that was sort of right around when things began to change quite dramatically. Uh, but so I'm really delighted it was uh, it was tabled before uh, Parliament changed its focus, understandably, to COVID. Uh, so the, I just want to give you the big picture because we can particularly talk about um, the experience and Carly and I, I, I'm looking forward to having a great chat with you more broadly. But to give you a sense of uh, the findings broadly of the sexual harassment inquiry, uh, this is uh, just to give you a sense, and I think I'm half on your screen. I've, managed to move that back. Uh, the report is quite a meaty tome, but I will tell you that there is a great executive summary in the community guide. So if you're interested to have a look, please do look there. So firstly, we found that sexual harassment is a common experience. Across the board, we found that one in three Australian workers had been sexually harassed in the last five years. And just to let you know that you fall squarely uh, within that, um, the health and social assistance sector was exactly at 33% and also was one of the top four industries for the prevalence of the experience of sexual harassment, but it was in the top four because you're such a large sector for employment and not because it was disproportionately happening in more um, in nursing and uh, your position statement that I'll come back to, but the uh, position for nurses is largely consistent with that. So the recent study in New South Wales showed that 2.3% of nurses had experienced inappropriate physical or sexual contact at work and that's been, um, and you're very well across a whole range of statistics, which I know the College of Nursing is right on top of. The second was the onus has been on victims to complain. So our current system really says sexual harassment is unlawful, but if you if you want to complain, then victims are to come forward. And we heard very much that people don't want to come forward. And if I go to those caring professions, I particularly heard that in an industry where you think of your job as being to care for others um, and to really put up with some pretty tough stuff, there is a particular, um, there was even a less a desire to complain. Your job is to actually be in really awful situations, put up with pretty uh, difficult um, traumatic things happening to people, their health, and to complain either about them or about other people who work in your profession really is counter to the training that you've had. And the reality is that's true across a lot of different professions and we found that less than one in five people will make a complaint. Very much I don't see Australians are going to start wanting to complain more about this in a formal sense, uh, not just because uh, we've just sort of a culture where we're told, take a joke, get along, don't complain, but also because of real fears about what will happen to your career and your job and your family life if you do complain. The third thing we found was that sexual harassment happens in every industry and particularly it's worth noting, I've already alluded to, but each industry has different prevalence rates and when you look at them closely, they also have particular drivers. So again, the position statement that um, uh, that has come out or that 
is to come out by the College of Nursing uh, really starts to flag some of those things. This is an industry where still there's a lot of men in senior roles in the health sector uh, that their your job is to care for people and perhaps to be in close physical contact with people and so it can be confusing or it cannot be confusing but sexual harassment can happen. You can be in isolated going into people's homes or you could be in uh, workplaces where the employment arrangements are a bit unclear. You've got medical consultants and nurses and you know who's cleaners and who's employed by who so it can be complex. So there are particular scenarios in different workplaces but it's a very common experience. And the last finding um, which of course Kelly at the time was a finance minister was looking at the cost of sexual harassment because of course we know the harm of it in a mental health and a health sense and uh, Deloitte Access Economics found that at a conservative estimate in 2018 sexual harassment cost 3.8 billion dollars uh, with a lot of that worn by employers so that was really helpful to remind employers that it's in their interest to stop sexual harassment. Um, so basically in a big picture idea we came to the conclusion that the current system, uh, the legal system and also the processes in place are complex and confusing for both victims and employers. Uh, so what we found was there needs to be a shift from this kind of reactive uh, complaints driven process to one that focuses on prevention and creates a positive duty on employers to really take some action to ensure there's a safe and respectful workplace. We made 55 recommendations across five different areas and those are listed there on the screen now. So better data and research. There's no question that our survey this year that broke down by industries is so much more valuable in our workplaces. Primary prevention, looking at education, the role of media and campaigns uh, to educate people more broadly. A new legal and regulatory framework, um, making sure the safety, the workplace laws and the discrimination laws work better together. Better workplace prevention and response and better support advice and advocacy. So I'm just going to go to those um, two last two areas just to make it sort of come alive for you about what this might mean in practice. So our recommendation about what should happen in workplaces really was looking at what's currently there and what would work better. So what we found is most workplaces have a practice of having a policy, training and complaints procedure. And for a range of reasons, with the best intentions, those have not worked to reduce sexual harassment. And in fact, our latest survey suggests that it's actually increased a little. Uh, what we found is there needs to be much more holistic approach. Um, and as is often uh, the case, uh, better focus on prevention, but particularly looking at leadership. So more engagement at leadership. This is not something that's off to the side for the HR people to deal with. All people who have leadership roles uh, are important to set the tone and to create safe workplaces. Uh, we in particular found the cultures of respect and integrity were really critical and uh, promotion of gender equality was important. The driver of sexual harassment is power disparities rather than sex and so we noticed that gender inequality was one of the key power disparities at play. Uh, we also focused more on a risk assessment and transparency transparency approach uh, in a nursing and in the health sector I think that might work well as well this idea of focusing on safety understanding what are the drivers and trying to address those rather than waiting till a complaint happens and finally a more sophisticated approach to knowledge so uh, once every two years training session was not delivering the education and the engagement needed in terms of um, the response mechanisms, we have made recommendations, which I'll talk to in a minute, about better supports for victims, about more options on reporting, including anonymous reporting, rather than having to, every time something happens, put your name, sign stat decks, all the things that lawyers love. Uh, that definitely isn't something that is working very well. And finally, measurement, learning from things that have gone wrong in the past and improving. So the last comment I was going to make before um, 
Carly and I, I'm sure, have a, a really engaging conversation is just to flag the sections that we talked about in terms of support, advice and advocacy uh, because we definitely heard in nursing that those supports are at the moment not working really well, perhaps not readily available. So when we looked at this, we found that when people had been harassed, they often needed support to help themselves through and they wanted information about what their options were. But depending on where you work, uh, what often happened was if you spoke to your employer, you suddenly were in some sort of major investigation process which might deliver neither what you needed, you're not getting the support for your welfare and you're still uh, quite shocked by what happened. So we made some recommendations about improving support services for victims uh, which need to be properly developed, resourced and easy to navigate. And uh, that overhead shows you some of the different things that are available and in place. Uh, and we found some models that were better at being more sensitive and more victim centred rather than focused on catching the bad guy and sacking him. Um, uh, instead, it should be focused on the individual. So Kylie, they were the kind of things that I was going to cover in those opening remarks, but as uh, we've agreed, I'm happy for you to take me wherever you'd like to take me. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, and for our audience of uh, the nurses, just wanted to let you know, Kate, that we have got nurses, nursing leaders from all over the, over the country who have joined us today, uh, Northern Territory, Tasmania, you know, from East and West. And so what you say will really matter. And I think it's, Australia has 415,000 registered nurses and midwives and the, the nature of the work that we do, as you've identified, it gets very um, intimate, more intimate than probably any other profession um, apart from carers in how close we get to people, um, the information that we share from a, a patient, client or resident perspective. And so one of the things that I've loved that you've focused on is sexual harassment. Uh, a workplace harassment and one of the things that I know that we talked about was uh, the Australian College of Nursing led a task force last year to look at the sexual harassment and sexual assault of nurses by patients. So one of the things that I, I wanted to um, just explore with you and, and just to let our, um, our audience, our listeners know that I did say to, to Kate Nurses are the best kind of people. Uh, obviously, we're all about uh, assessing and understanding people from a physical, psychological, spiritual and uh, so mental health perspective. So we'll want to know, Kate, and, and get your advice on different ways that we can do more and be more. So one of the things, Kate, before I get into some of the work that we're doing and, and some of the advice from you, I just wanted to let you know that the nursing profession for decades now has remained female dominated. And the latest uh, uh, stats that we have are probably about two years old, but we've got about 89% female or about 88% female dominated, uh, about 10-11% male and less than 1% of our profession identifies as non-binary. And so we have diversity in our profession. Um, we have challenges being female dominated, which um, society is underpinning. We come from historically being either very saintly or, uh, you know, you Google images of nursing, we're over-sexualized. And uh, so it's very, it's been, it's been a challenge and there's been champions who are taking us into modern day where we should be recognised as professionals. So we're doing work to get gender equality, but of course um, there's up to about 20% of the, the management and leadership positions are male dominated, so we have that disproportion in our profession as well. So just setting a little bit of context there, and um, one of the things that I'd like to do at the Australian College of Nursing is looking at your support, advice and advocacy and seeing if we can do anything to support nurses. But can I ask you what your thoughts are on the work that we did at the task force last year around uh, patients being sexually assaulted or sexually harassed by patients? We've, there's probably a, not a nurse that we know yet who hasn't experienced some sort of assault or harassment uh, in the workplace from the people that we serve. And so have you got any thoughts around that for us? 
Yes, I, I really um, incredibly welcome the work that you have done. Uh, two immediate responses to that question. First and foremost, probably the one thing I came up with through the inquiry was the most effective way to address sexual harassment and to really start the shift that is long overdue is to work in with an industry focus and to yeah. recognise the specific elements. So I know you're doing more than just on patients, but understanding all the dynamics, uh, because I think, uh, well, what's really clear, because I, before I was in this role and I was the Victorian Commissioner before that, but then I had 20 years in legal practice. And I think for the last 30 years, Australia has treated sexual harassment as the fault of quite often a few bad men. Uh, very much individual misconduct and hasn't really recognised the systemic nature of the problem and hasn't recognised that uh, actually, you know, every nurse that comes in is dealing with this same problem. So it's not just a few bad people. And if you're going to one of my uh, friends, colleague, the eSafety Commissioner, she talks about social media, but I think this on sexual harassment. If you're going to deal with it one by one, she says it's like swatting away individual bees while the swarm's coming at you. Kind of the idea that um, this is a systemic issue. So that's first and foremost, I think, coming together, there are a number of things to be done, but to really recognise what's the actual experience of nurses, what are the risk, what are the risk moments. So our inquiry broadly found that there are some people that are at greater risk, and the reality is women are at greater risk. So men still experience sexual harassment. 39% uh, of women, 26% of men. So it's quite high, but women in particular have greater risk. Young people at higher risk. So we know some people are at higher risk, some groups like LGBTI communities were at high risk, uh, some environments, so people who worked in remote locations like on mine sites but also going into people's homes and then some industries had high risk. So that's my general comment on um, doing the work. I actually think you will um, thankfully get results with that uh, razor focus that you've got. The second comment is uh, focusing on patient uh, behaviour, physical and sexual harassment, all those kinds of things, I think is a really good and um, a great place. You know, how do they say, how do you eat an elephant one mouthful at a time? You kind of, there's a big problem, but actually strategically picking those places where you would put your focus. I think that there is, um, there's a few reasons why that's a good place to focus right now. One is actually, it's, it, it's, I haven't seen your stats, I'm sure you know them, but it's probably high in terms of prevalence. Uh, it's probably more, you know, there's a, there's percentage wise. Now I'll use the example. So during, uh, we did this inquiry, but we also did some work for the Shops Distributive and Allied Employees Union, so the Shoppies Union. And we did a survey for them looking at sexual harassment of people basically working in retail shops, cafes, you know, kind of hospitality. And that survey found that 30% of the harassment happened at the hands of customers, diners, you know, so it, it's the kind of, it's the same. That interaction with people who are not co-workers that you yeah. serve, that you're meant to be serving. And so I'm sure your statistics would be similar. The other thing is, I think we've got a moment where our community, both through Me Too, but also looking at the importance in COVID, that actually the community is starting to speak up. Um, there's other contexts, like the corporate context, where we're actually saying it's not okay to treat such important people in our community badly. So you've got a bit of a social um, kind of momentum now. It's not going to be, oh, what, you know, you just have to put up with that. I think there's a social change in attitudes. And so you've got to grab that attitude um, and then come up with some really, uh, and, and I also know there's been this building over time as there's been in retail of basically, uh, this is not acceptable and some awful stories in the health sector broadly. So my comment on that is I think one, doing it by industry is a great idea and the position statement of the things to do is a perfect example and, and there are other good examples like in the university sector, in the media sector where similar initiatives have started. And two, I do think it is a really good idea to start with a focus on that patient 
uh, patient behaviour because they're part of a community that's broadly saying you can't treat people like this and and in that moment you know these are the most important people that should not be treated you know with sexual harassment. I really love your words there and I know that you did a national survey on the sexual assault and sexual harassment of uh, university students so I know that this is very close to your heart and of course nurses are undergraduate students but throughout the lifespan one of the things that we've been um, tackling is the social reform that nurses can lead. Nurses are the most trusted and ethical profession, have mm -hmm. been for decades, and uh, nursing is about 90% female dominated, as I said, but around the world, healthcare is about 70% female dominated, and so we, we've got such gender challenges and opportunities within not only our profession, but the industry. And one of the things that we found in some of the work that we looked at in the task force and what we believe um, and, and why we're, we're tackling these issues is because they are societal and they're systemic issues and that even those patients with cognitive impairment um, or confusion would still pick the one nurse when they came on a shift to sexually harass or assault. So it wasn't that kind of behaviour that was random or for any care worker but that it was different whether it was um, the gender of, of the nurse um, is to how they responded and so even with cognitive impairment there is still such an underlying uh, pathology or acceptance in society of how we treat women um, which then reflects to how we treat nurses so we have a we're really um, tackling this at every angle which I think is uh, is, you know, as you're saying, the way to go. And so I, I'll talk to you a little bit um, more about the work that we're going to do tackling women and violence um, because nurses will either be caring for people who are experiencing some sort of harassment or violence or discrimination. They will be experiencing it themselves in relationships. The stats say that we're twice as likely to be in those type of relationships or they will, you know, particularly occupational violence. We've had nurses who have died, um, Gail's, uh, Gail Woodford. There's, there's many experiences of violence in the community and nurses experiencing violence in the workplace. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it, it really does um, stem from harassment, whether that's uh, in the workplace from patients and then how that goes to what we're expected to tolerate as a society. And do you have any thoughts on, I mean, for, for thousands of years we've tolerated um, bad behaviour. When do you really see we're going to get that equality that we're striving for? Yeah, that, that's my full-time job, but I'm not the only one that's um, here aiming for it. Um, uh, we we know that this is, uh, you know, sometimes I have to remind myself of the progress that we have made um, because sometimes it's just so incredibly frustrating if I think about the nursing sector and, you know, the pay rates as well as um, sort of just broadly equality and men taking on roles in nursing. That there's, there's a few things still to go. Um, so in the big picture, the kind of things I have focused on are particularly looking at um, women's economic security and that includes a lot about their working lives and their financial uh, violence against women and also women in leadership and particularly I guess uh, I'm particularly um, interested to think about women in political leadership because I, again I think this year it's become really evident that in a crisis we're looking to our political leaders to make decisions for all of us and so while we I think we've got a gender balance in it which is fantastic uh, we still are a long way across the board to having uh, really good voices of women and if there's any um, people watching that are thinking about even local government I'd encourage you to think about it um, or local, state, federal, you know, go for it. Uh, we need people with different experiences and experiences of our community in all parts of that decision making. Um, so that's the the broader comment. I, I agree that um, we, we have in Australia made some really good progress on some gender equality, um, just broadly educating women and girls um, 
some of our legal structures are good. We were the first country to have sexual harassment in the laws. Uh, but yes. if I bounce off what you're saying, one people do then think, well, why in a country that we think things should be fair, you know, why really have we only ever had one female prime minister? Why have we only, you know, we talk about the ones all the time and the aim is to have more than one. Um, yes. And we've got some, I, I think the reality is in Australia there's been, for whatever reason, a really much firmer hold on those traditional roles of what men and women do, what work they do, what they do at home. Uh, we know and COVID's reminded us that women still do twice as much caring and domestic work in the home. Uh, what You know, who goes to work, who stays home, who becomes a cop, who becomes a nurse kind of thing. So we have really um, stuck to those and also attitudes about uh, gender and gender equality. And particularly if I think of something that you said that made me bounce to this idea of um, that really difficult to digest discrimination, the subtle kind of um, it's there all the time. Uh, we in Australia do some really good research pieces. So we have done something called the Time Use Survey, which has been incredibly valuable because in the past we used to just measure what people did at work. But this is this has really pointed out that no wonder women can't work as much because they're doing all the caring in the housework. Um, and so that's why... Um, you know, that's why we find that women are more likely to be part-time casual than full-time and men more likely to be full-time. Uh, but we also have another survey that is called the National Community Attitude Survey. And I think that that piece of information is really helpful because I, if I think about a conversation I had just this week uh, with my mother, so uh, she would be surprised to hear that she's been referenced in this <laughs> webinar. Um, but she had just, I saw her a couple of days ago, she's in her 80s and she had seen the reporting about uh, the sexual assault of someone through using Tinder that, you know, the, uh, and, and I sort of know the eSafety Commissioner, I know all these things about safety by design, you know, my head's all in this. And her comment was, uh, if a woman gets in the back of a car with a man, what does she expect? And, you know, that very much that violent, you know, the kind of victim blaming. And I said, yes. well, she doesn't expect someone will, you know, rape her. Uh, and so we had, yes. we had, but I realised this National Community Attitude Survey shows us that we hold things that are called violent supportive attitudes. So even though we might not be violent ourselves, uh, they are attitudes that justify, dismiss, minimi minimise, um, even uh, kind of uh, sort of, um, well, and all blame the victim. So for sexual harassment, for example, and I think nurses will get this all the time, uh, and people will often think, oh, do I speak up or not? It's, well, that's part of the job. What were you wearing? What did you say? You know, kind of did you lay them on? You know, surely he misunderstood you know, justify, well, he, he had a bad day, all these sorts of things. So that research is really interesting because it shows where those attitudes exist. It creates an environment where then the general environment kind of permits things to happen and it's a bit of a slippery slope. So in, in nursing, I think there's a lot of that, the expectation of what women will do, what you'll put up with. And, uh, and I think we have to get on this momentum. And in Australia, the Me Too movement has been a slow build but you know when uh, workers of the AMP company are saying this isn't good enough uh, there is something that's happening about you know and I'm talking to my mum and saying well just you know rather than blaming the woman for that uh, let's think about you know kind of think about it differently and uh, I'm not sure that she will but I think it's not just a generational thing I think some of that is very much learned. I, I really appreciate you using that example and I think that um, it really is uh, just a classic of we've all been brought up and socialised to be aware um, and to be on alert as a potential victim rather than society saying stop the behaviour and really tackle men's behaviour and not women. So I, I think that that would be very familiar to all of us in our generation of parents. And even, uh, you know, I've had great conversations with my sons. One of them is a lawyer and doing a lot of work on peer-led primary prevention of sexual assault and is teaching me about consent 
because you know I'm a, mm. I was um, born in '69, and and it was just uh, it's amazing in a generation how um, how far we've come, but how much we have to learn. So I think sometimes it's even our young um, will teach us, and we we need to keep educating um, up so that the future don't experience what we or anyone in the past uh, has experienced. I, I loved your example of uh, Julia Gillard and irrespective of whatever your preference for politics, you're absolutely right, Australia's had one Prime Minister and we've all witnessed that she got treated very differently to any other uh, counterpart or male prime minister. And so some of the, uh, you, you know, we're encouraging people to go into politics. There's a couple of nurses who um, have been in state and territory politics and we have one in um, uh, federal, um, as a, an elected member of federal politics now, but really it's how do we encourage women to participate when they're going to be the first and maybe the only ones and there's a lot of battering around that and so it's, it's somehow how we dissect that. One of the things from the nursing profession's perspective is that we we can actually change the world, one, because of our number, two, because of the, the communities that we get to care for and have conversations with. And so if we can get the language and learn the language, it's then how can we lead and role model and influence others in a very uh, non-threatening um, and safe environment. So I think that there's much that we can still do to really influence where we go as a society. And it, it, it is around the language that we use and the expectations. So that victim blaming that you've said is really important for us and what that means because we've just got a psyche of being grown up and being influenced into believing that way. So uh, so we need to retrain ourselves. You've. Um, I'm going to ask you a few more questions, but you've, you've just had on with your mother. One of the things that I was wondering with you, Kate, because there's thousands of lawyers graduate every year, you've dedicated your life to fighting for equality. Who, who was Kate when she was 12 years old? Did you see this path for yourself? Uh, that, that's really interesting. I think some um, some women I know who are doing uh, work, I spoke to someone recently who who was in politics actually and had a really tough uh, time, a very sexist treatment in a political context and she called me and I just talked through kind of how it works, what had happened, how women and men have different experiences and how sometimes men don't even see it because it's not their lived experience. Um, uh, but we both discussed that, you know, in an ideal world, we'd be focusing our life on something else because this would not be an issue. So to some degree, the reason I'm doing this uh, this job is because actually the, the kind of, I, I'd actually trace it back to even younger than that, that sense of injustice about, you know, if, if I know in my body I'm just as talented as my brothers, but they for some reason are going to get paid more, and you know that just that just sends me right off. Um, and I grew up on it's quite interesting because I grew up on an orchard in Templestowe in Victoria. So if anyone's a Victorian, you'll know um, it's been a little while since um, that Templestowe was orchards, uh, but it was until I was 12 I was there. But what what I do remember, and I took on the Victorian Human Rights Commissioner role in 2013, what I do remember in the Sun pictorial was the story of this woman called Deborah Laurie, who was the woman who brought the first discrimination case in Victoria. The laws came in in uh, 77 and her case went, uh, I think it went all the way to the High Court in 79. So it was reported she wanted to be a pilot. Reg Ansett absolutely did not want her to be a pilot and he said, I don't want you to be a pilot. And some of the things he said about, you know, your menstruation cycle and your, your kind of your hormones, it's going to be a mess in the cockpit. Um, and uh, and she won, you know, it was the first case. I remember that. I remember that as a young child, so obviously that was always something that just seemed so unjust. Um, so that has been there. But when I was at uni, I mean, I did law and discrimination, but 80s, 1984 was when the Sex Discrimination Act came in. I'm doing a bit of a history tour, but many people, you know, if you're a bit older, I've just heard not only are we close, but our birthdays are obviously close as well. We're similar age. Um, yeah. uh, Susan Ryan uh, pushed forward to get the Sex Discrimination Act 
um, passed. Susan um, passed away just two weeks ago at the age of 77. Um, so we're having a bit of a moment to reflect on what she achieved. And what she achieved was absolutely remarkable. And I'd encourage um, it, you, that you follow the funeral will be in a week or so um, to hear more about what she achieved. She was the Age Discrimination Commissioner when I started at the Commission. So she continued through her work. Um, but I think when I was at university, I didn't think that, uh, I thought that lots of this would have been done. Um, but my career in law ended up in employment law and then, you know, partly because of passion and interest and partly because the boys didn't want to do it, I did discrimination and that sort of led me here, as do careers, Care you yeah. know, kind of. So I wouldn't have guessed it. it I, this current job is such a privilege because yeah. The issue is so important, but you know, people are so committed now that it's really yeah. important. I do a good job to make a difference, not just for women, but for our country to be more prosperous. Um, but if I piece it back, I don't think I would have known, partly because I would have hoped there would not have needed to be a conversation about you know patients not harassing nurses, for example. That would not have yeah. seemed to be something that we should be talking about in 2020. It's interesting because you're a, a, a mum and a stepmum to, to five kids. There's many nurses who are caring for um, not only that don't, don't only go to work and care, but you know families, parents, um, and children. So it's inter you're absolutely right. Who would have thought in 2020 we'd just be starting to have the conversation about or tw 2019 of what is tolerable and what isn't as a profession? Because we've all just you know, you just knew that it was part of your job and so it, it's unlocking that frame of thinking so that our, our children and the next generations absolutely never have to put up with what we have. I just want to remind uh, everybody that there's an opportunity to type in questions. Um, I know that uh, I'm asking Kate questions and I have lots more to talk about, but please send your questions through so that uh, you can get your perspective from Kate. Uh, now, while, while everybody does that, Kate, I just want to read out a quote that you uh, said a few years ago. I'm sorry, I just have to turn my head. Without equal pay and lifetime economic security for women and girls, we will never have an equal society. And I think the, there was a report that was commissioned a few years ago, about 2015 now, uh, called the Triple Impact Report. And there's a global organisation that Australia, that it, um, the Australian College of Nursing is leading here in Australia called Nursing Now. And that Triple Impact Report talked about gender equality and how educating and um, building capacity in women and, and healthy communities can make such a difference. This year we've seen, we've really gone to war. We've gone to war with a virus. It's completely changed um, every facet of our life. We started off, uh, you, you know, with a health crisis and an economic crisis. And here in Victoria, where we are, still in our 5K uh, lockdown, it's really becoming a social crisis. And at the forefront this year, unlike any other time in history when, when we've been at war, it's women who have really led at the forefront in um, whether it's you know in, in the shops, in our childcare workers and the schools, and of course in nursing and health. What are your thoughts about how we get um, when we come through this on the other side, hopefully in 2021, about the role and the rights of women? Do you think it'll be re regarded, or do you think we'll, we'll be acknowledged now, but perhaps still have to keep fighting? Uh, I think the latter, what you've described, um, when we, uh, the, the stats tell us, so while some people say, you know, this is a shock that women have been hit harder, actually if you look at the roles women play and where, you know, where they work, the industries they're in, the type of work, uh, it wasn't shocking that when you had a pandemic that uh, women were either at the front line in health and yeah. in uh, teaching, childcare, or they were the ones who were in the face-to-face -face jobs that really got shut down, so hospitality, retail, tourism, um, sport really was shut down as well, but the arts, uh, so, so that was the impact. But then you flip into home, kids homeschooling, and the research quickly told us that women who do twice as much caring and domestic work and that continued even when um, 
the people that were working at home, there might be the mum and dad, but there were stories about the dad saying, uh, you know, shutting the door and saying, don't disturb me. And, you know, mothers who were kind of already pretty um, concerned and trying to keep their part-time job going, but also with their other um, sort of doing maths. And uh, so, so that has been the impact. Um, there's a couple of things in terms of my work. So as of March, you know, I thought my year was going to be uh, actually, I had some. I was due on the 8th of March to go to New York and Washington to talk about the report and share it with stakeholders in the US. Um, but my kind of focus completely flipped, and the focus has been really looking on the lessons of COVID, um, supporting women through COVID, uh, particularly the family violence conversations that you know everyone will have heard of and. Sadly, some of you might be experienced making sure the support to them, making sure people who are told they can't leave their house know that they can if they're facing violence and criminal behaviour. So those immediate responses, what I, what I saw was some really government, you know, early it was really um, encouraging to see governments coming together, national cabinet, quick decisions being made and then remade um, where, you know, the mistakes were there. So uh, there was quick decisions on realising the domestic violence issue and some supports provided. Quick decision on childcare to realise if we need a nurse to go to work, then that we also need them to have access to childcare. Um, there, were, <laughs> there was a quick decision about 30-minute haircuts that were was reassessed, and that that was the moment when I thought, oh, there really wasn't a woman in that room, <laughs> and yeah. I'm sure there was, but it was kind of one of those where we all went, no. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so there was. There was some, you know, early quick decisions. I think in the longer term, we can't assume that the fact that where women are being valued in the different professions uh, will convert to, you know, I, my view is we know the research tells us that our recovery will be fastest if we access all the talents in our communities. Yes. Uh, we get everyone spending money. We know women spend the money in the places we want it to be spent um, in you know, kind of investment back into the community. Um, but there has been an early focus, no question, on announcements about infrastructure projects which go towards male-dominated jobs, yep. almost the reverse of what you said. Yep. Um, and I think it's really important we keep up that focus on recognising why childcare actually enables women and men to go to work, while female-dominated industries are big employers and productive. Um, and particularly one of my main concerns, which you will hear me now, anyone who's never heard me talk will notice it everywhere, is for older women. Older women yeah. were already in that, so going to that quote that you gave, you know, there's a lifetime accumulation through caring and not earning and not accumulating super and the pay gap and taking time out for your children and then looking after older um, relatives. Uh, Older women are the fastest grow, growing group of homeless people um, already, and I think because of you know having to access super, the budget has really focused on younger workers, and we know discrimination means that if someone, an older worker, falls out of the workplace, uh, it's very difficult for them to get back in. So uh, I think that. Uh, I agree with your statement. You know, I think the value of women and the importance and the spotlight on this issue has been cast. Um, but I'm not for a minute assuming that that I think that we're getting a bit of a template of how you come out of recessions. But the previous recessions were led by financial crisis, manufacturing downturns, which were quite a different issue to what we're facing now. So that's kind of my sense. Yeah, absolutely. And hearing that they're going to invest in infrastructure straight away, you realise we haven't really learnt a lot from this, have we? So we we will keep championing in any way that we can because the investment, uh, where the investment should be made, should be broad. Um, but that didn't, unfortunately, surprise me. One question that I do, I would love to hear your thoughts on, is around leadership. Uh, every nurse uh, is or should be a leader and understand that whether that's leading your patients or residents or clients to good health 
or leading teams. And one of the things that I've always said in, is when nurses lead, organisations follow. Where our leadership skills and expertise have been pivotal throughout this whole year and probably been polarised for the community to understand how important nurses and nursing leadership is. And the Australian College of Nursing has championed the importance of nursing leadership and the investment in that for years. I was wondering what, what did you see as your top three or five attributes of leadership um, that you would think that nurses should have or, or especially in this year? Um, yeah, so I think I think that's, yeah, just, that's a, I'll just yeah. let everyone know. I've given Kate no idea of the questions that are coming. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you can probably tell from my face. Um, so my first comment was broadly about leadership, and and I, your question makes me think. Over my career, I have seen some. Uh, so as a corporate lawyer, lots of the senior execs were men. Um, over that sort of 20, 20 years from the 90s. Uh, but I worked with some remarkable senior women and I was interested in how often those senior women came from a teaching or nursing background. So it's a really interesting question that you're asking. Now part of me says, well, probably because um, at the age I was, and if I go back a generation or two, there were, you know, secretaries, nursing, teaching, these were the professions that uh, women were encouraged towards. Um, and so when women wanted to branch out, they often branched out from there. Um, but I would say the skills, those women that I think of were remarkable leaders and had different experiences. Obviously, as a woman, you've just got a different experience, a different lived experience. Um, but nurses in particular and teachers, I think you need to have that empathy and the understanding of other people because to actually get things done, having a good idea and being insistent that that's what should happen isn't how things happen. You have to have such an understanding of the complexity of how things work and also how other people, what's driving them, what are their concerns, what are their fears, uh, what will happen. So the first thing I would say that might be learned, it might be innate, uh, but that caring background the useful thing from a leadership point of view is just the recognition that everyone's an individual and understanding how people work together and how to kind of get the best out of people around you. So I think that's uh, really a critical element. Um, in this year, I would say as well, and, and we read in the paper, um, and this is a lingo word, but I still understand what it means, is that resilience, the kind of, um, I think for me in my profession, my career as I've gone up, each um, opportunity to be promoted, when people say, oh, you're fantastic and you're doing great things, usually that means it's 10 billion times harder and I get more kicks in the guts and I, you know, I get more disappointments and, you know, it, it's kind of smoke and mirrors and we're seeing um, a lot of leaders, you know, it's pretty tough and I, I make no comment but I'm um, on this, but I'm looking at the newspaper of Gladys Berejiklian who's kind yeah. of got to the top of, you know, her career and the sort of the scrutiny and the um, the ability to kind of know and have support and be able to pick yourself up again and learn from mistakes is, I think, one of the other things. I'm sure there's some other things, but um, those are the two. Understanding how people work and the complexities of getting things done. A bit of persistence. So if I go back to in terms of leadership, um, and I think she was a teacher, Susan Ryan. I can't remember what she was originally, but she was, when she got elected to parliament, um, so she, that was in about uh, 73, maybe 75. So I think she got elected at the same point that um, Whitlam got kicked out. So right. here she, she was a single mum at that point, two kids. Um, she come, She decided this is what she was going to do. She was going to um, kind of stand up for what, you know, she believed women should, um, uh, you know, have a voice. So she thought, I'll do this. She gets elected. They lose. She's on the back bench. She does a private member's bill. But really for the, for the first period, she wasn't in power. 
and then when they got to power under Hawke, she was ready to go and she put this legislation forward, but the opposition was strong. It wasn't just strong on the other side of the House, it was strong within her own party. She was the only woman, I think, in the Senate at the time, and I often look at her and I think um, of her example, there was a lot of patience, there was definitely persistence and there was also pragmatism and it's just a coincidence yeah. that they're all P words but she did make some compromises that you know if you stick if you're absolutely rigorous you would say you shouldn't have changed the act and she's like it wasn't going to get through if I didn't do this so this yeah. is kind of how I did it so some of those qualities which are not the glamorous leadership qualities that yeah. um, we think of but that you know just sticking with it so yeah those are some of my thoughts I think that's really important, the non-glamorous side. Most of us don't want to let everyone know how hard it is. Uh, and your smokes and mirrors um, comment and sometimes selling teaching the guts is really important because it is tough. And often in nursing leadership, there'll only be one executive director of nursing and midwifery or one director of nursing or one chief uh, nurse and midwifery officer. So it can get quite lonely at the top of an organisation. And uh, you've got so many people relying on you and then the, and the care and the professional practice or the research or the education. Um, and then how do we actually look after each other? Um, I've got a few questions that have come through. One of them that I want to ask you from um, our, our guests that are watching. Uh, is an a as an agent of change, have recent events of the world changed your view of the world for better or worse? Ah, uh, yes. Um, I think that it's reminded me that we do have, we can't take things for granted. We do have to be flexible. Um, it's also reminded me how small the world is, but also you know how. Um, so what do, what do I think? I think, you know, I'm watching internationally. I think it's been interesting to see how different countries have responded to uh, this crisis. And um, yeah. as someone who does uh, gender equality, uh, particularly interesting to see female-led countries and how um, what are the traits that have happened there that have meant that by and large they have done better. Um, so I'm not someone who thinks men are better or women are better, uh, but I do think that there are certain uh, environmental factors um, that uh, that mean that women operate in a different way in leadership. And uh, Julie Gillard's written a really interesting book recently called Women in Leadership, and she's interviewed about eight. Uh, global women leaders with some theories on you know how they kind of navigate issues and you know the comments on their appearance and all different things but it's been interesting there's been some good um, commentary and research on female dominated leadership and that idea of taking advice being more consultative being more inclusive actually having worked really well also being more prepared to take tough decisions um, and make uh, some long-term decisions. Um, so what would I say about this year? I would say I'm optimistic about this year. I do think it's important uh, for men and women, but just the greater recognition of those jobs that are often lowly paid um, or low, at the lower end, and that tends to be the caring professions, the teaching professions, the professions that women are in. I'm really optimistic as well about um, the number of men I've heard who've realised that their priorities were out of whack and that they really do plan on trying to have dinner with their family more, that they will look at more flexibility. So I think that might change the workplace better for all of us. And um, internationally, I think in terms of gender equality, I think we have been in a moment where um, the forward movement has stalled and a lot of my job has been to hold on to the ground that we have. And yep. um, international politics, and you'll all know we're in, a, in the middle of a US election yep. cycle, uh, but I think it does matter who is leading that country and um, and what messages that is sent by some of these 
uh, leaders about how they respect women um, and that it, it does affect us globally. Um, but I'm, I'm, there is also some things that I'm really proud of Australia for and I guess some of it is uh, our stand on women's rights on some fundamental things in terms of women's health and reproductive rights. The Minister for Women, Maurice Payne, is, you know, is having to speak up more loudly on um, things that are important for women in a global context where there's some pretty big world powers who are, you know, who are really pushing against women's rights in terms of their body and, you know, their futures. We, we gave evidence last year and we've been um, uh, heavily involved in fighting for a couple of years now, one with Queensland, but particularly in New South Wales to decriminalise uh, abortion, not even to get into the pro-life debate, but actually so that nurses and doctors didn't um, face incarceration if they were providing a service. And so it's, it's really... You know, I gave evidence um, to the parliament, but we didn't think we would have to have that much of a battle to change law that had been around for over a hundred years and that just wasn't relevant. So we're, you're, you're right. Even even the fight for reproductive rights is still. You wouldn't think um, the U.S. would be exhibiting the the leadership and the behaviours that they are, and people fighting. Um, and I would hate to see that um, have any effect here or us to lose ground, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Julia Gillard um, and the interviews that she did. One of them was with uh, Anne-Marie Rafferty, who is the president of in the UK of the Royal College of Nursing and a great friend to Australian nurses and the Australian College of Nursing. Uh, and just for the audience to know, about two nights ago, she was named uh, a dame in their orders of the um, British Empire. So that's very exciting for a nurse to be given that kind of honour. And um, of course, she's a, you know, a very strong um, uh, advocate for nursing all around the world. Uh, I just have a, another question for you from, uh, from people. I'm just, let me scroll up here. There was one that came through. When it comes to discrimination against women, what is one area or issue that does not get discussed enough? What a great question. What are we not talking about? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I'm glad you've got to answer it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think we've had a lot of conversation about women in leadership, even though we haven't had a lot of progress. I think that up until now um, in Australia, we've had a high focus on domestic and family violence, but particularly on physical and sexual violence. So you might have noticed there is some conversations about um, coercive control, so different types of um, violence. I think we're starting to get momentum about online, about elder abuse about sexual harassment, but um, that hadn't been a real focus. Um, I guess I would say we're starting to get a conversation about older women, but that's probably the one that, you know, the hidden epidemic of, you know, homeless older women. Um, so I don't think, uh, and, and it doesn't make logical sense that we wouldn't care more about how our older people are treated. If we're lucky, we will all be in that category someday. You know, some of us mightn't be um, be Indigenous or mightn't do a ho get a whole lot of other attributes, but all of us will be there. So I think that we haven't been talking about older women and recognising that, you know, the really dire financial situation that older women are in and how that's emerged over this generation of women. Um, and also, um, to some degree, that the model of, um, so there's in this uh, the current time I look and even in our uh, leadership across the board, often men who are CEOs or politicians um, often have a woman who's a wife who is a full-time stay-at-home or part-time, certainly secondary and does the caring. And um, I would like there to be more of a conversation about how that is actually enabling that person and the self-interest in keeping that model in place for at but that a different solution could be more beneficial for the whole family, for the children, for the economic position. Um, but I'm sure there's other things that um, 
certainly there's some topics that have started to emerge and are very polarizing. Transgender rights is um, one that uh, does, um, I don't think we're at a mature point for the conversation that in a country where, you know, really people should be able to participate, I've been quite involved with sporting codes that have started looking at guidance on yeah. including transgender people, but there's still very much a conversation that says that no, that should not happen. Um, so that's sort of an emerging conversation, but there will be others and I will go away and tonight sometime I will have the perfect answer for this question to whoever asked it. And no, it is a great question and I'm glad you got it, but um, no, I, I think that there, there's so much in all of your answers and I really appreciate it. You get me thinking along the way, uh, but particularly with our transgender community and um, um, all members of the LGBTQI community, we're, we're doing everything we can at the Australian College of Nursing. We're just about to release a diversity and inclusion paper because it's very important that anybody who is in our care, even if it's the, the guiding principles that we're going to share will even say don't just presume a pronoun. It's not okay to think that somebody's male or female and that the way that nurses can ask questions for, t for taking histories or um, saying hello to somebody in a ward or a unit or in the community could make a tremendous difference to them feeling accepted um, in care. So that any, any guidance you can give us on that would be really well received because um, you're looking in the sporting and other areas where we need that equality, but ward configurations and units and care or even in the way that we address, we've got a lot of work to do to really be um, making sure that everybody that is in the care of a nurse or a health professional is treated as they wish. So I, I really like you mentioning that one. Um, one. Another question, you ready for another one, Kate? I am. Okay, this is a message to both you and I, but of course I will, um, whoops, I just moved it too far, my apologies. I have to say to, right, as a, as a leader, if you were to take on a new team tomorrow, how would you go about establishing a culture whereby, hang on, sorry, that's moved, whereby your employees feel comfortable and confident to approach you with concerns of sexual, ah, this, this too big a question for my space, um, for sexual harassment without fear of repercussions. And you actually mentioned that this is a concern of um, disclosure or, or asking questions. So I'd, yes. I think how do yes. we set the culture for safety? Yes. And I'll take that as new team or current team because I think most people that that is um, one of the things our national inquiry really focused on. So one of the things that I asked as I went around in those consultations because we heard lots of uh, sadly a lot of really terrible stories and long term impacts. Um, but there were some occasions where I said, okay, can you think of a time when you've been in a workplace where you know, there wasn't sexual harassment, where you thought it was good, where you felt comfortable to come forward. And uh, this question goes to the answer. So I often joke that not once did they say there was a really, it was a workplace that had a great policy. Like no one cares less about the written policies, even though everyone has the policies. Um, the most consistent answer was where I've got a direct line manager who I feel comfortable who I know what they expect, so they set a tone of the how we're meant to behave, uh, but I also really feel comfortable that I could talk to them about anything. And some of those examples, I mean, there's no question that women have a bit of an advantage here, because some of those examples were just that women had sat down and said, and the one I'm thinking of in particular was, someone, a university student who had worked in, you know, kind of bars and cafes and she'd yeah. given one example where her, you know, the cafe manager had said, this should not happen to you but realistically it does. So if this happens, come and talk to me because we need to do something about it. But, you know, like, and it's a bit awkward to say this is going to happen to you, but I imagine nursing is the same, that this should not happen, but if it does. So what, um, what I observed is uh, when I sort of talked to men, uh, so I did some focus groups just with men, which was actually really helpful because uh, whilst uh, the women um, 
I learned so much, I obviously can draw on my personal experience. Um, when I spoke to the men, and particularly the men who were leaders, what I realised is they weren't really clear on what sexual harassment was. But more importantly, they didn't know what to do. So even if they saw something, do I speak to him? Do I speak to her? Do I speak now? Do I speak later? Should I not do anything at all? Do I go to HR? Like it was really kind of was like, my, no wonder you're not handling it. And so they do nothing. Yeah. Um, so for them, but the other thing is um, that with lots of managers, the only time you deal with sexual harassment is when it's a problem. And so one of the things I've noticed, I've done like countless webinars on this topic. Uh, this is one of my most interesting ones because I'm getting all these great questions. Um, but countless where um, people really say, if this happens, what do I do? And I keep thinking they only really engage when there's a, you know, like a train wreck has happened. You know, she's, yeah. it's what happened at the Christmas party? So my main suggestion, and it can be hard, but is to, rather than wait to once every two years and have an online course that you do, that as a leader you talk to your staff about things that you acknowledge that you might not know the perfect answer, but you kind of say, you know, you just reinforce in those regular conversations because most staff don't get confidence in their boss just because their boss has said, trust me, you can talk to me. They get it from that trust that you build over time. And uh, some of it is how you behave, some of it is what you say, but some of it is just the relentless repetition and yeah. some of it is being prepared to talk about the no-go topics and sexual harassment definitely I notice for men is seen as an absolute no-go topic which m means that they're not doing a very good job on setting the tone and making it safe to speak up. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely key there, Kate, because organisations we need to meet legislative requirements, uh, so there will be the mandatory training and the policies, but we actually know that that, that might be part of structure and strategy to, to meet obligations, but it doesn't address culture. And I would uh, have to say that it really is in the leader about having the conversations, being brave enough to use the language to, to put it out there, um, as well as having the training, but then really saying that there's some options or what do we do or having a safe space. I know at the Australian College of Nursing I have a CEO session every uh, month, it's been every fortnight during COVID but with the staff and there's never an agenda, it's never planned, any questions can come forward. Uh, we have Slido so that questions can come forward anonymously or they can send questions in. So it's even something as simple as that as starting to say, all right, I'm here to answer anything um, and let the questions flow and if we don't know, say we don't know but we'll find out. And I think that it's actually the leaders that need to lead by example and I can imagine it would be challenging or um, for men. The one thing about the nursing profession is that we get the, the best of men come in um, to be nurses so we should be able to lead this very easily because we have such champions in our male colleagues around equality and um, what how, how we help society and women. Now the next question, so thank you for that question, great question. Um, I'll just say to Sue, just bring them in a bit slower Sue because I can't read them all. Um, domestic violence and violence against women, how can this be highlighted to the community as the harm to women is costing the lives of women as we know, costing the community in regard to the healthcare system and the justice system and I would have to say from personal experience it's also to the children and then how we support them growing up but that's a great question. So over to you Kate. Yes, yeah. So Australia has done some things that are very um, world leading actually in this area that um, that is encouraging but we are, uh, we absolutely have, it's a terrible, terrible um, situation where one woman a week is dying at the hands of a current or former intimate partner but the stats on the actual prevalence rate, like I think, you know, that's just the people who die, uh, the actual physical and mental abuse that is happening is, is we've just got to acknowledge that it is um, so prevalent. Um, Australia in 2010 established the first 
uh, national plan for the prevention of violence against women and their children. It was really focused on domestic and family violence, although it's broadened out over time to other types of violence. Um, and out of that, um, a, a few things have been established that people would now know. So 1-800-RESPECT, for example, Our Watch, yeah. which is the foundation for prevention on uh, of uh, domestic and family violence and yeah. its chair is Natasha Stott Despoyer who is absolutely the most remarkable advocate and reminder of just the seriousness of this tragic epidemic and also Anne Rose which is the Australian National Organ Anne Rose and Australian National Research Organization for Women's Safety. Um, so they're just some of the infrastructure in place. Uh, we have, uh, so our current government has committed, so that was a 12-year plan, so it goes from 2010 to 2022, and, and it's been broken down. So I guess I just tell people who are interested, there is um, quite, a, you know, that's been actually a much better focus than I think a lot of other countries do look to us. It doesn't mean we've got the answer, but there's, yeah. it's much more sophisticated than just saying this is outrageous. Um, so the government has committed to the next one. They're currently consulting on that. That's super important. But separately, the question really talked about that spotlight. And my observation is on domestic and family violence, um, almost every state has had, whilst we have all these terrible situations, there's one that really captures the imagination and that then kicks in people into action. And nationally, we know Rosie Batty's story and Rosie continues to be a remarkable advocate. But I know um, in Adelaide, there was a convention centre murder. In Queensland, there were a couple of murders a few years ago. So there's definitely, uh, and, and this year, in fact, um, the awful Hannah Clark murders in New South Wales. Um, I, I guess the important thing that we've seen in terms of the spotlight on that is the media being more sophisticated in talking about this, um, that we're making sure that it's reminding us that it's a systemic issue, that it's something that we all demand change, um, sharing what people can do and also really uh, encouraging governments. And it's it's a sort of a combined effort really. So we know Business Now is looking at it as a workplace issue. So we need community, we need NGOs, the women's sector, we need governments at all levels and it's actually a complex issue but absolutely it's got to be one of the most compelling things that we've got to change because to think that you know a woman is least safe in her own home is just a, a terrible tragedy for this country. So I, I think that um, keeping the spotlight on it is important. I think all of us should care. I also think all of us can learn how to so in Victoria there was the Royal Commission and one of the things that I really noticed, there was a small thing on prevention, but if I think about nurses and church groups and schools and places, hairdressers. So there was a lot of um, in the community people who actually, if you know the right language, could be the place that someone reaches out. And I think uh, that that everyone understands you might be the person and, you know, can we equip you to be that person um, can make a big difference. But then I flip to what Our Watch does, what I do, what you're talking about. Actually, this goes to the societal issue. The key driver is gender inequality. But been in situations where men have all the money, have all the power, uh, we need to flip that round. And so a lot of my work is the broader social change that we need to reduce that and other issues that women face. Kate, one of the things that we spoke about earlier in the week was the task force that we're just pulling together now. And for the person that asked uh, that question, we, uh, the Australian College of Nursing called a task force uh, a couple of months, or uh, probably in July or August, um, we had overwhelming response, not only from our members because we put it out to members, but nurses that um, weren't members of the college, people that weren't nurses, all asking if they could be part of it. And you're exactly right because we nurses 
uh, get killed on the job. Nurses are in relationships and nurses are caring for people. So we've got a meeting in a couple of weeks and we're going to tackle, um, originally I was calling it um, women and violence or women and domestic violence, but in fact I've had responses from people saying same-sex relationship violence, men experiencing violence. So we're going to call that nurses and um, violence and see how we can actually lead societal change from all aspects. So we will keep um, everyone um, posted on what we can do and Kate, I'd certainly any advice or guidance along the way we'd be most grateful for. Um, so I'll, I'll let you know as we go. Um, we're meeting in a couple of weeks to get started. The next question, I've got a couple more questions for you, Kate, uh, and then we'll let you have a breather. What would your advice be, Kate, uh, for up and coming nurse leaders, for example, recent graduates, and how to tackle embedded cultures and ways of doing things within the healthcare sector, especially in regards to person-centered care, i.e. patients and their, some of these questions just go over the top patients uh, and their families' care is being treated with respect and as equals. Uh, and I'm, I might partly refer that back to you, Carly, because you're going to know that cohort better than I am. Uh, so I, I probably will. My, my main reflection for young people um, broadly in whatever profession is to, and probably this is a lesson that I learned, is to, as well as um, making connections across the profession, you know, just um, make good connections in different industries as well. There's a point when you start your career and you start getting um, kind of brainwashed slash trained into that industry. There's a point where you can't remember that actually that's not the only way to do things. And for yeah. new entrants, the great thing is you, you're not in that brainwashed state. But I was in the legal, in a law firm for 20 years. And when I finally left, I went, oh, how did I miss that the world is much more complicated than, you know, get a law, put some facts into it, find the answer. So yeah. that would be one of the things that I would encourage is to just, you know, those different connections, but professionally make different connections uh, just to, and, and know that people are very generous and happy to share you because both in the good times and the bad, so those other networks really help. But Carly, I'm interested in your view on that. Yeah, look, I, I say this as a registered nurse uh, and somebody who's given my, my life and career to the nursing profession. Whilst we are voted the most trusted and um, ethical profession, and I, and I stand by that, the reality is I think almost every nurse must have experienced working in environments where the culture is not as nurturing to colleagues as it is to patients. And as much as I don't like to say that, uh, it is a reality and it's a challenge that you know we're all facing and have to do something about. So uh, one of the things that I would say, and I've been that early career person trying to fight against um, even innovation or efficiencies that, or improvement just because a culture was stuck in doing things um, and it does get a little bit lonely and it does it is tough to be that voice so you do learn pretty early on skills of influence negotiation pretty much what you said earlier Kate about uh, you, you know how can you get something through even with politicians of they might have to give up something but it's it's persistence and tenacity that is going to be developed very early in um, in the person that has put that forward. And even if it, your workplace isn't a workplace um, that exhibits the values and the behaviours that you would like to see, perhaps you're the one to influence that. But to take care of yourself, you must mm -hmm. find like-minded people. One of the things that I've found is that we're never alone. There will be people like us, even if it's not in the same team or the work environment, somewhere in the country, um, you'll find someone and then you can get the strength of peers that are like you. And so whether it's the emerging nurse leaders or different programs, know that you're not alone, even if it feels alone. And it's absolutely essential that people can see that we need to change and then we actually change. And there's brilliant leaders all around the country that want our uh, early graduates and emerging leaders to actually make that change and we'll do what we can to get people to sort of step aside. Because we know with an ageing population and an ageing workforce, it's going to be a little bit like a tsunami that we, we've got to change the way that we think. And I think health is quite burdened with this. And I'd say this for pretty much most of the professions. But medicine and nursing, it's hierarchical. And so that you get regard in seniority. Um, but that doesn't actually mean that 
that's where all the ideas can come from. So we have to actually flip it and see that we're here to serve the early career uh, graduates and bring your ideas and let's work together to innovate. Um, it's the only way we'll be able to have a health system for the future. So I would say to the person that wrote that question, I hear you, it's not an easy answer. Any of us that have been fighters for change and transformation will know your story. Find people that are like you and don't give up. Um, patients and the communities that we serve need you. So over to, we'll, we'll get to the last questions here, Kate. Kate, you made a great point about the culture being set from the top down, the example the CEOs. How do, you, how do rank and file staff set or reset the culture from the bottom up? I love this because it's the power of the people. Yes, and I, and I do think we're at a moment where, uh, and you talked before about young people, and I've got a 14-year-old son who sometimes pulls me off, up on gender stereotypes. So um, we're at the first time, I think there's research on the number of generations in our workforce, but also at a moment where young, not just young, but more junior people are having more of, um, so at all parts of the organisation, are having a say over influencing things. So yeah, we have talked about top down, but I, I, I'm completely uh, of the view, if I go to a completely different sector, I do a lot of work with the Australian Defence Force, and I, I am a, a you know, I have huge respect for the Defence Force and I know they have a very good medical corps, including nurses, um, uh, but uh, their leadership has been on a cultural reform journey and I know, and everyone in that organisation knows, that the Chief of Defence, the Secretary, the three Chiefs of Services, so Navy, Air Force and Army, are very committed to uh, diversity, to inclusion, particularly of Indigenous members as well as women. Uh, and yet, uh, the reality is um, the numbers are still, you know, it's, it's hard to shift a culture. So having that top-down declaration isn't the answer. It has to be sort of right through the organisation. The next thing we often talk about is that middle managers, they're the blocks. But in fact, I look all the way through. So um, if I think about that comment about the influencing, the Me Too movement, and you know, I'm sort of talking about that, but that really is the voice of the everyday people. Yeah. Uh, if I go back to that last question, I would say junior people and young people don't underestimate uh, how um, important your views are, how kind of particularly in a collective, how you can uh, really demand change that might be slow coming um, from the top. Um, and how you can also support each other and send messages. So if, uh, just to give you a couple of different, I've given you defence, but another place that's very interested in what peers can do is the legal profession. Now I've got mixed views about this, but there's lots of conversations about bystander training, you know, the legal profession. I, I am putting to them that you can't, you know, delegate uh, the responsibility for sexual harassment to the other junior people when, you know, the reality is it's about power. Um, but that idea of culture changing by how, you know, that when you come in, if everyone's expecting the woman to clear the coffee, you know, and take the minutes, uh, you've got to change that and it's everyone in the room to notice that. So I do think that um, in a group, uh, there's actually quite often more of them, so you need to work out what's safe, but a little bit of courage sometimes when you're not on the line might be able to make some changes to the culture. So I'm completely in uh, in line with that question, top down but bottom up has to, has, it's the only way. Thank you, Kate. And an example that I could give you for, for us is, um, that's quite similar to the one that you were saying about the uh, Defence Force is the gender inequality we have in nursing. So for when medicine and law and other professions actually became a little bit more gender balanced and in fact now I think they would probably have more female graduates, nursing never shifted. For at least three or four decades nursing has always been female dominated and so we've got a fantastic uh, working party and the men of, uh, the men in uh, nursing working party and there's a group of probably around 16 people, probably half and half men and women who are uh, 
none identify as non-binary, but who are working to really get um, gender equity so that more men want to come into nursing because what we realise is that there's stereotypes around the word nurse. And so when a little girl, let's say, just says she wants to be a nurse, people will say that's nice, but what do we, what's the societal response when a boy says I want to be a, a nurse? And so how yep. far do we have to go to influence societal change uh, so that it's not seen as um, that why would you do that or and to get some of that um, gender bias away from it. And the hashtag that uh, Luke Yukoto and that group put out was that it's okay for men to care. So we've been driving this social movement to say that men should be allowed to choose um, nurturing, caring professions and that it's nothing about being a woman. In fact, it's about the um, essence of the person who wants to give a life of service, basically. So we have our own little experiences of, we're saying that at the top, there's some real champions, but we've got a long way to go to get there. So I will make this the, the last question. Somebody else asked a question about um, that manager level, but I think that you've already answered that one. So I'll have this as our final question, if that's all right with you, Kate, because we must be exhausting you. Um, and this is a, a great question. Let me just... Each time I move it, um, just shuffles through. How optimistic are you that societal and workplace change can happen? So here's the realist of the group. So thank you to the person that wrote this. We're all fighting for equality. How optimistic are you that it'll actually happen? Uh, I am optimistic, but not not that it will happen by natural evolution. I think right. that natural evolution drives us back to, you know, kind of funding infrastructure projects and we kind of fall back into women staying home. So I'm optimistic because I think we've learnt a lot over the way. I think that Australia as a country is very committed to the idea of fairness for everyone and everyone having a fair go. Um, but I also think that there's some really interesting strategic, uh, clever initiatives and uh, a bit like, you know, we often talk about, you know, seatbelt speeding, you know, we're a country that um, we recognise that you've got to do multiple things at the same time, uh, but we are starting to do those multiple things that we need to do. So I, I, I am, without doubt, I'm optimistic. I'm pretty motivated though and pretty determined. Um, and I'm really excited, like, for example, I mean, thank you to whoever's stuck, or stuck around for this conversation this long. <laughs> it's a big ask, an hour and a half of listening to two people talking, I don't know, whether, you know, I really appreciate that, but the fact that you've tuned into this conversation just gives me, that's one of the reasons, like there's been so much active conversation and it's not ridiculous, old, oh, you know, women shouldn't be able to do this or this is hopeless. The, um, the conversation is now much more curious, much more interested in what do we need to do and much more understanding of the complexity of the problems we're facing. So you can probably tell I'm very optimistic, but I don't underestimate the magnitude of the task. Yeah, that's a great answer and you know that in itself is a great quote. I might even put that in inverted commas if you don't mind, Kate. And, um, and put that around this because there's, there's hope but there's work in that. I'm not sure if you're aware, Kate, that the nursing profession in its modern form has been in Australia for about 151 years. Lucy Osborne was a Nightingale nurse that came over um, probably 102, uh, 152 years now. Now, of course, people have been cared for for thousands of years and we've got a, you know, we acknowledge the bush nursing and the traditional healers and people that always cared. And so nursing, I see um, that nursing it is a real pivotal time right now. We, we've changed in those 150 years. 100 years ago, we couldn't take a blood pressure or do things that were doctor's duties and, and we're a profession in our own right with our own professional license, our own code of conduct uh, and code of ethics. And I think that we're, the work that we've been doing at the Australian College of Nursing is really about growing up and growing into our own right um, to have a voice, to sit at the table, to be expected to be invited, to have people want to hear what we have to say because of the value and the contribution of nurses and nursing. And I think that it's the richness of these kind of contributions. It's not only in the clinical care or the academic work 
or the consultancy or the education that we do, but it's in understanding who we are right now in 2020, what we represent, the contribution we can make every day. Nurses are the have got an incredible work ethic. We always go above and beyond. There's not a nurse that doesn't give more. But then it's taking that extra opportunity to look up a little bit, look out at the horizon and say, what do we need to do right now to take society with us in where we want to go to be fair and just and diverse and inclusive? And so to have this kind of conversation with you and for you to be so open and generous in your sharings is absolutely an honor and a privilege Kate and I know people will have stayed nurses you can't let us go at a dance floor at a party we'll, we'll stay for a great conversation and I hope that one day in the future when we're all allowed to get together again even with isolating that we would have you back uh, in person because it's been an absolute pleasure to hear your thoughts and I'm sure I speak um, on behalf of all of the people that are listening that we'll take a little bit of what you've said um, into our workplaces and our worlds just to help you on your cause because we're all there with you to make a difference for all of, uh, for basically all, all Australians and all the people that we serve. So thank you very much. Do you have any um, final words that you would like to share with us? No, just thank you. This has been a privilege to talk to you and also through you to talk to the nursing community. I just really appreciate both the work you do and also that bigger vision of a better Australia. So thank you. The, the beauty about uh, Kate and I might even be in a 5K radius. We haven't worked that out. But Kate, I, I love the, the people like us who are um, young but wise. And so we really have this wonderful opportunity now to, to make a difference for all the future generations. And we're right there with you. Um, and appreciate everything that you're doing and so thank you very much for your time and to Amy who's taken such good care of all of us as well. Give her a very big thank you please. So on behalf of everybody and the Australian College of Nursing, normally we'd be you know, kisses on the cheeks and flowers and big applause but uh, we'll send that virtually to you. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye.